Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know, in the film Unforgiven, the outlaw William Money said, quote, it's a hell of a thing, killing a man. They take away everything he's got and all he's ever gonna have. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that sounds a whole lot like neoliberalism. Taking away everything you've got, one contract at a time, until finally you've got nothing, and then you're dead. Preferably thanks to a Hellfire missile fired from some predatory drone. Or I should say predator drone. Stacey. <laughs> it is a predatory drone as well because it's predatory capitalism. And the first headline is, Big Bank's analyst worries that Iran deal could depress weapons sales. So you know that there's this alleged deal that could possibly happen with Iran. Well, an analyst from Deutsche Bank was very concerned about this. The possibility of an Iran nuclear deal depressing weapon sales was raised by Miles Walton, an analyst from Germany's Deutsche Bank during a Lockheed earnings call this past January 27th. Walton asked Marilyn Houston, the chief executive of Lockheed Martin, if an Iran agreement could, quote, impede what you see as progress in foreign military sales. She said, don't worry because a lot of volatility, a lot of instability, a lot of things that are happening in both the Middle East and the Asia Pacific region means that they, these are growth areas for Lockheed Martin. Well, war is a Ponzi scheme fed by dead bodies. And I think you gotta understand that these so-called wars are nothing more than ways to enrich the defense contractors and the, the neocons. I think the Vietnam War, America lost, what, 58,000 servicemen, but it made a lot of people very, very, very rich in America. And those people went on to become the neocons of the 21st century, and they love to start wars for a profit, whether it's Victoria Newland starting a war in Ukraine against Russia. That's purely for profit. There's no ideology other and attached other than, I want to get as rich as I possibly can, as quick as I possibly can, because I'm a psycho. Well, it's interesting, though, that the likes of Deutsche Bank would be, their analysts would be concerned about what the future profitability and a, a peace deal is, uh, is something that they're concerned about, whether or not they should warn their you know, investors. Yeah, they're, that... they're worried about whether they run out of dead bodies. Yeah. I mean, just like any like Bernie Madoff, you needed fresh suckers to give him money to keep, keep the Ponzi scheme going. Uh, these folks are saying, this report from Deutsche Bank is saying, what if we run out of dead bodies? What if we stop killing people for convenience? What will happen to our profits and our banks collateralized by all these dead bodies? Well, as they also point out, it's that uh, there aren't actually any dead bodies there in Iran. A few, you know, you know, every once in a while there's some sabotage. But what they like is that fear. So if there's a peace deal, then the fear is removed. As they point out, uh, Defense One reports that over the next five years, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Qatar, and Jordan are expected to spend more than $165 billion on arms. And in the U.S., concerns over ISIS and Iran have prompted calls for an increase in the defense budget. Now, of course, one thing that is a negative to fear and war spending is dead bodies coming home. That's what ended the Vietnam War was all those photographs of dead U.S. soldiers, their, their coffins arriving at the Air Force Base. So we don't show those anymore, but it helps a, even a lot more if we don't have any U.S. soldiers actually going overseas. As long as we keep fear and everybody in conflict, then we could just continue selling them. In fact, Lockheed Martin says they're, right now 20% uh, of their sales come from overseas and they're hoping to get it to 25%. So they're hoping to stoke more and more fear over there. When soldiers go off to war for these, comp for these countries, they should realize that their entire contribution to life on this planet is to become garden mulch. If they think there's something other involved than that, they are freaking... They need their head examined. Here's a tweet from Motherboard regarding uh, death as well. And the prescription drug market is literally killing cancer patients. A study out this week from economics researchers at MIT offers a new perspective on the said marketplace in healthcare and, and pharmaceuticals, particularly among its star earners cancer drugs. Every year since 1995, a group of 58 leading cancer medications has increased on average by 10%. In 1995, they used to, on average, cost $54,100 per year of added life, while in 2013, they cost about $207,000 per added year on average, an almost 300% increase in total. And they point out through various, you know, because of patent laws and regulations and all this stuff, that actually they're, the, all the new drugs coming out are more and more focused on just um, the 
providing very short-term gain in life expectancy for a huge amount of money. So they talk about this Avastin, which is used for colorectal cancer, and it extends life by an average of five months, and it costs $50,000 for a single dose. For a skin cancer drug, it costs $120,000 per treatment, and it extends life by only four months. So they're focusing more and more on that because there's more and more money and it costs less time to research. There's less R&D uh, time in that. Yeah, I think it's very uh, analogous to what's happening in the global banking system with negative interest rates. Negative interest rates are an attempt to uh, effectively buy time by, by monetizing mm -hmm. this idea that we have screwed up the planet so badly and that there's an eco ecological apocalypse within the next six to 12 months, we're willing to take a negative interest rate now to try to stave that off in, in some manner to, to give us an end of life jolt. So here you're saying that drug costs are such that to get another five month window, you're willing to ramp up the cost toward the end to enhance this surge uh, uh, of, of pre-death. Pre um. Well, partly because when they first create the medicine, as soon as they create it, the day it's finished, it's made, it's there, it takes them, uh, that's when it goes on patent. So they get 20 years of a patent. And if it takes, uh, if they extend your life by 10 years, that's a, uh, wasting time on their patent for their clinical trials. So they want something that like, oh, will increase your life for a week, you know, and it, here's $120,000 for it. So as they say- Right, here, so the we're willing to, to go into debt. You see, money is very cheap. You can, you can borrow money at 0% to, to extend your life by three weeks. It's the same thing with negative interest rates. I'm willing to actually take a negative rate of return to, expand, to extend my life by three weeks. So this is all related to negative interest rates. It's also, it's an incredibly cynical view of the pharmaceutical companies that have placed life in, in Central Bank on the, same, on the same level. Well, maybe you won't want to live much longer, especially in America, because according to this headline, Retirement Crisis, the Great 401k Experiment Has Failed for Many Americans. So the median amount in a 401k, which is now the primary source of your pension fund, there are no longer defined benefits uh, plans. There are very few of them around in America, certainly not for any new joiners. That The median amount in your 401k is 18,433, but 40 percent of, of, of pension holders in America in these 401ks have less than 10,000 and that the only people really contributing they found to these are people who earn $126,000 per year or more. So it's a tax relief for people who are already earning high incomes. Those under 126,000 do not have the extra money to add into these 401ks. So what they're saying that is in America, when we had disability and defined benefit plans, you actually had an equality of retirement period. Now the rich can retire and workers have to work until they die, said Teresa Gilducci, a uh, labor economist at the New School for Social Research, who has proposed eliminating the tax breaks for 401ks and using the money saved to create government-run retirement plans. Right. In the old days, you used to have a retirement account that paid you some kind of retirement income. Then Wall Street lobbied during the 80s, this all got started, to open that up to Wall Street. And then if Wall Street would call people up and they would get them to completely obliterate their savings plans use by you know Bernie Madoff type uh, and other savings etc or they get no return on their savings it's a zero percent rate of return now what's happening in the UK under George Osborne's budget 2015 speech he's not going to open that all up to the city of London and within 10 years all that money will be completely gone well in fact what they point out is that um People can guide their, basically they have two choices to make and this is always works against them. 401ks change two things. You could choose not to participate and you chose your own investments, which a lot of people I think screw up, she said. So people are buying high and selling low over and over with their, their examination. Of course they do that wrong case. because they watch CNBC and CNBC is a churn network. They get people to buy uh, too high and sell too low. If you watch James Kramer on CNBC, you would have been completely broke years and years ago. He, his performance is negative, negative, negative. And this is the entire industry. It's owned by CNBC and it's owned by the entire major media in the UK. It's meant to defraud you and steal all your money. This is coming to the UK now. Well, there's an actual number about how much they're defrauding you and this is part of the problem. So right in the fourth quarter of 2014, there was four and a half trillion dollars in 401ks in total. Well, 20% of it by the time you 
retire is lost to fees. But the other thing is another problem is that when 401k savers retire, they often opt to take their savings in a lump sum and roll the money into IRAs, which may entail higher fees and expose them to conflicted investment advice. A recent report by the Council of Economic Advisors found that savers receiving such advice, which may be suitable for them but not optimal, see investment returns reduced by a full percentage point on average. Overall, the report found that conflicted investment advice costs savers $17 billion per year. Let me, let me explain something to you about the effect of compounded rate of interest, which Einstein called one of the most powerful force in the universe. It's rumored that the island of Manhattan was bought for something equivalent to $24 in shells or trinkets of that time. If that money were put into an account and was compounding at 5% a year from the date of that transaction, that account would now be sufficient to buy the entire island of Manhattan for a, a, over a trillion dollars. That's the, uh, that's the power of a compounded rate of interest. Those exact numbers, don't quote me, <laughs> it's similar to what I just said. You get my point. Uh, what I'm saying here is that by simply putting money into an interest-bearing account and letting it, the magic of a compounded rate of return, work over 20 or 30 or 40 years, you're going to have a retirement income. If somebody from one of the big four banks here in the UK calls you with a hot tip, just put a bullet into the chamber and blow your head off because you're saving yourself a lot of aggravation. Well, we got to go, Stacey. Well, Social Security is next, of course. They want to turn them into 401ks. Duh. All right, well, stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. Hitler had allowed just one week for his army to take Stalingrad. In August 1942, the Luftwaffe destroyed more than half the city. 90,000 people perished. By the end of autumn that year, Stalingrad was in all but complete ruins. But despite being pinned down by the Volga, Red Army soldiers held their ground and soon lodged an offensive. Мы впервые за доступательный период Сталинградской битвы помылись в бане, смогли построить землянку, чтобы можно было встретить Новый год. И вот вечером 31 декабря ко мне в землянку приходит старшина и приносит какой-то сверток. На нем написано «Сталинград храброму солдату, дорогой сынок, посылаю тебе на фронт теплые варежки и носки, теплое белье, носи их, вернись обязательно живым домой». И была подпись «Тетка Мария». Я начал искать адрес обратный. Откуда это письмо? Откуда эта посылка? Нигде не написано, ни одной строчки. И после войны я написал поэму, которую назвал «Тетка Мария». «Тетка Мария, я шепчу в траншеи, Автомат мой, как всегда, на шее. Тетка Мария, я во сне кричу, Адрес твой кричу, знать хочу. Пули и снаряды завывают, Снятся сталинградские бои. Мне и нынче руки согревают, Тетка Мария, варежки твои. Мой дедушка очень бодрый, хотя ему скоро будет 92 года. Каждое утро он обливается холодной водой. Дедушка говорил, что был взрыв, и со временем он стал все хуже и хуже слышать левым ухом. И навсегда остался без слуха. Слышать теперь только правым. А дедушке очень нравится, как я играю на фортепиано. Он, наверное, как я, живет стихами и разными рассказами. А на самом деле, печатать на машинке то же самое, что играть на фортепиано. Нужно э, иногда взять правильные аккорды, правильно выразить э, то, что ты хочешь. Э, просто на печатной машинке это сделать проще, а в музыке это как бы зашифровано. О, 
моя родная. You can find all the latest developments on this story by heading to our website, that's rt.com. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Egon von Greyerts of Matterhorn Asset Management in Switzerland. Egon, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you very much, Max. It's a great time to be here. Uh, it's great from the point of view that we have so much to talk about. It's not great for the world, sadly. But yeah, well, uh, let's get into it. And I, I wanted to start off by asking you about what's happening in France, because in France, they are limiting people in terms of how much money they can take out at the bank at one time. They've limited to 1,000 euros. It was like two or 3,000 euros. Uh, they're getting very involved in people's day-to-day -day business, where this, how, how they're spending money. You can't spend a certain amount of money without alerting the authorities. You can't take out more than 10,000 euros a month without alerting the authorities. It seems to me that France knows that 0% interest rates are coming that they're going to start charging people to keep their money at the bank, and they don't, and they don't want people taking that money out of the bank mm. and sticking it into your vaults in Switzerland or even into cash mm. and putting it into the bank. Isn't this a, a pernicious form of capital controls? And talk about this a little bit. Absolutely. We will have worldwide capital controls. You know, right, today you're a criminal if you go to the bank and ask for cash. Most banks in the world ask you a lot of questions, and if you want a bigger amount, they will stop you. Although it's actually not illegal in most countries to take out bigger amounts, but still, they will do everything they can to stop you. The banks are in a mess. France is the next sick child of Europe, in my view. Uh, they will have massive problems, and exchange controls will be part uh, of, their, of their solution. It's not a solution, of course. So in other words, you've got, in Europe, countries going bust. Obviously, Greece has gone bust. As Yanis Varoufakis has said, we're bust. Mm. So there's no point in talking about what we do if we go bust. We're already bust. Absolutely. In uh, Italy, it's a terrible uh, situation. Uh, Ireland uh, went bust. They got bailed out. But now it looks like they're going to go bust again because there's a housing bubble. Yeah. But you think France, think yeah. now this contagion, if you will, is going to hit France. Talk about this a little. Yeah, no, I, I think the French economy, I mean, they're making, their, their deficit is among the biggest in, in Europe uh, still. They have uh, a unions which are not going to accept any austerity. And the only, France will have austerity, like any country in, needs to in, in a deficit situation. You look as at Greece, Italy, but no country will accept, no people, including the French especially, will accept austerity. Therefore, I see the problems being bigger in France than anywhere else because they will actually have unions that are going to just stop all activity. Right, so French, uh, the, the France uh, ability to do any reforms at all is pretty well dead in the water. You know, going back to Sarkozy, when he was first in office, tried a whole suite of, uh, yeah. of reforms. He was yeah. booted out. The people decided yeah. they didn't want reforms. Uh, now, under the current administration, under Hollande, uh, he's been not effective in any way. Now they're thinking about bringing back Sarkozy. I lived in France for many times. It seems that they, well, the second they put a new president in, they immediately turn on him and he becomes the most unpopular president yeah. in history. I mean, French, the French culture itself is something to contend with. Uh, if we can put it on those terms, you know, in, in Europe, the countries are remarkably different, uh, culturally speaking. France, Germany, Greece, Switzerland, they're very, very different. The French seem particularly intractable when it comes to this type of meaningful reform, do you think? Yes, they, they won't accept it. But I forecast a long time ago that every country, in, in certainly in, in Europe, will change governments regularly now because any new government that comes in promises the earth. 
they can't keep it. Look at Greece now. Either they're going to compromise or they have to leave uh, the EU. I think they should leave the EU, default, uh, in, in, install a new currency, the drachma, start from fresh again. Uh, but of course, the Troika will do everything they can to stop them because they know that it will lead to Italy, Spain, Portugal asking for the same con uh, conditions um, uh, if, if they actually, or either, either asking for the same conditions uh, or also starting to have fin financial collapse in their country. So I think that uh, we will now see parties coming in and out on a regular basis in Europe. Uh, and no party will last because they promise the earth when they come in, and when they come in, they can't deliver, they'll be thrown out, and therefore we will have a form of anarchy starting in politics because politicians will not ever be able to rule the country properly. Now, uh, in the case of Greece, the, the folks in Greece, they want two things. They want to be part of the euro, and they want the end of austerity. It seems like these two goals are mutually exclusive. Either you want the end of austerity, or you want to be part of the euro. You can't have both. Yeah. What, what, is, that, is that a fair statement? It's fair, and this is what has happened to Europe today, that people are used to being spoon-fed by the government and looked after totally. So they want everything, but they don't want any austerity. Of course, we know the two will never reconcile. Greece is bust, as you said. All of Europe is bust, certainly southern Europe. Um, and uh, therefore, in my view, there is no solution. Of course, there isn't solution, no, any solution. They might try to, they will find a compromise short term, but long term, I mean, the whole, in my view, uh, and I said it when it started, the, the European Union will break up. The, the euro is an artificial currency that should never have been there. It won't last. It's only a question if some countries will still have it for a while. Now, Egan, you're at Gold uh, Switzerland, yeah. is the company. You're in Switzerland. And the business model is a very interesting business model because basically you can sit back and just wait because throughout history, every fiat currency that's ever come has ended in disaster and worth nothing. And throughout history, gold has always been the currency at the end of the day. Gold, we always come back to gold. So basically, you have uh, gold Switzerland in Switzerland. Right now, there's a love affair with fiat again, yeah. whether it's the euro or the dollar was an, uh, you know, making a move much higher. But are we in a very strange situation where the supply of dollars, the supply of treasury paper is at an all-time high, and yet the price goes up, whereas the demand for gold globally is some of the, one of the strongest periods in history, and the price has been trending sideways to lower. Doesn't that repudiate everything we know about economics? Yeah, yeah you're making a lot of important points here. Uh, First of all, the demand for gold, physical gold is very high, and there's actually a shortage in the market of physical gold. Now, because what has happened, as you know, is that all the gold goes from west to east. Before, when bullion banks got gold from central banks, leased gold or, or sold gold, is kept within the London pool or, or in New York. Now, China is the buyer, and they take delivery. So that the physical gold market is now strained. But the, the uh, paper gold market is, of course, 100 times the physical, and therefore, the, the governments of central banks and uh, some financial institutions, the big banks in the US, <laughs> Goldman, JP Morgan, etc., they are manipulating the price and pushing it down continuously. And that's going to uh, probably end this year, in my view, and when the market sees that there actually is no paper, no gold to deliver against the paper longs, they are going to go, these banks are not going to be able to deliver, they will actually have to cash settle and they will lose a lot of money. Okay, but first of all, let me jump in and say, yeah. you're, you're calling for a gold uh, breakout and a breakdown in paper currencies this year, 2015, and your track record in this regard is quite, quite stellar. Uh, you're not making this prediction lightly. I mean, this is, uh, this is, this is coming from somebody who's really at the, the nexus of the global gold market. And so your, your thought is that this year we do have this reversion to the mean, this sudden uh, re-evaluation on the global scale where fiat currency resumes its natural uh, value, which is not very much at all. And we have this gold then re uh, coming back and assuming its mantle as, as, as the top currency. 
What, what's going on with the top one-tenth of one percent? It seems to me that once they're, they're flirting with these fiat currencies, the, the high-tech stocks and the New York Stock Exchange, et cetera, but once the, the psychology changes, they can very quickly get into gold, and those who are left on the sidelines will be out of luck. Absolutely. And especially the first ones will be the ones who hold the ETFs, hold the paper gold. They won't get any gold. Um, if you have good connections, because, you know, remember, there's about 2,500 tons produced every year. And if you buy direct from refiners, which we do, uh, you will always get gold. Uh, but there won't be gold for the masses. I mean, I can see now, I mean, you know, I'm in the hyperinflationary camp. I believe that you look at the money printing. And let us just look at the money printing now. You know, Japan, I mean, in my view, Japan is going to not the country, the country will survive, but the economy will, will sink into the Pacific. They are not going to survive. There's no chance of it. 250% uh, debt to GDP now growing, printing, you know, a trillion, a trillion uh, or quadrillion yen debt going up, no effect on the economy. China, as you know, it's gone from two trillion to uh, 28 trillion. Their their uh, borrowings in in uh, this century, uh, they will have problems, and they have problems already. They and of course that has repercussions for the whole world because they were buying all the commodities from the world. Now we know commodities are crashing, and uh, the Baltic Dry Index, which is a good example of actually what's happening in world trade, is at an all-time low. So you know we talk about Europe as the only problem child, but I mean I see the U.S. as the big problem. The U.S., everybody's an optimistic, dollar has been strong, the U.S. economy is strong. Every single figure is actually now worse than expected uh, in the U.S. Stock markets are, the, the, the Russell 2000 is on a 90 historic P.E. But everybody looks at future P.E. and they exclude all the items uh, there. So they, they talk about a lot lower. The real P.E. is 90. The S&P is on historic basis for last year. The last 12 months is over 20. When companies buy back their own stock, doesn't that totally distort PE? Because yeah, they're taking away absolutely. less to... This is why they're doing it. Right, so this, they get 0% interest rates absolutely. to borrow money at zero. Absolutely. They buy back their own stock. Absolutely. So there's less stock around. Yeah. So now earnings look better exactly. because it's divided by less stock. Yeah. Yeah. And they say, our, our PE is not that bad. Yeah, yeah. But you're saying if you take out the gimmicks, yeah. you take out the junk, yeah. you end up with a 90 PE... On the Russell 2000. On the Russell 2000, which yeah. is the broadest measure Absolutely. of, of on, the index. On, on the last 12 months. Which is really freaking high. Gap. Is that that's high? That's, 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 higher than, that's higher than Matterhorn. That. Matterhorn. <laughs> it is higher than Matterhorn. <laughs> uh, that's, that's an achievement. <laughs> it, uh, unbelievable. <laughs> and, okay, we have to have to go. But we're going to come back for a, to part two if you can okay. stay with us. Yeah, okay, I can stay. Okay. Uh, that's it for this episode of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest. Egon Van Gryertz of Matterhorn Asset Management. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.